like 20% of our firm success in this one person. Yeah. And think about it that way. Imagine your investment. Imagine your investment. 20% of its profits is coming from one person, right? It's hugely important. Welcome to Funds That Won, where we dive into some of the world's most renowned investment funds. We'll interview investment managers across the alternative landscape and learn how they built their million and even billion dollar asset management empires. We'll explore teams, structures, strategies, and best practices in launching and running alternative investment funds. All right, what is up, everybody? Today I've got Kaloa with Wolfgram Capital here with us today. Um, you know, I've 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 seen Kaloa around for a while. He's always posting about these crazy deals he's taken down inside of our ecosystem. So I'm super excited to have him on with us today. Uh, Kaloa, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me on board and uh, excited to talk about what we're doing and some of the things we worked on and how we think about the investing landscape. Yeah. Love it, man. Well, why don't you why don't you start off by telling us a little bit of background about yourself and your firm? Yeah. So I I, I did not start in finance. Uh, my my first real professional was in was in, in sports. Uh, I was a bobsledder on the USA team, and, oh, no and way. figured yeah figured that uh, I should probably not uh, peg my income ability to sliding down a mountain of ice in spandex. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, went, went to school, uh, eventually ended up at Yale Law School, uh, founded a small prop tech company, venture backed. Um, I exited and then did VC for a little bit in New York with first round capital um, and was actually looking to exit the tech scene to do uh, real estate, private equity. And, and so uh, in December of 2021, I formed Wolfgram Capital. And over the last uh, 13 months, we've done 220 million in, in, in um, acquisitions. We mainly focus in the hospitality space. Wow, that's crazy. So bobsledding, let me get this straight. Bobsledding to venture capital, now in private equity, real estate. Is that right? Yep, yep. <laughs> hey, that's quite a journey. That's that's awesome. That, that That's great. Well, tell us a little bit about kind of your buy box, what type of deals you like to do and and what you focus on. And and we'll, we'll hear later about, you know, what you think about today's environment obviously real estate's a little crazy for that but first tell us a little bit about you know what type of deals interest you yeah so we have a interesting mix uh between so we, we focus on hospitality particularly hotels and resorts and within hospitality uh there's a whole bunch of different types of brands right if, if you stayed at a marriott and sometimes it can be confusing right fairfield courtyard residence in town place suite spring hill right um those brands, right, kind of sit to, and then they market to different customers. And so you might have on the top end of a brand, like the Marriott's five-star brand is Ritz-Carlton, Hilton's is the Waldorf. And then on the other side of the of the brand levels, uh, Marriott's, you know, entry brand is like a Fairfield or a Spring Hill Suites or a Courtyard and, and, and Hilton's is, you know, Hampton Inn. Um, and so within those within those spaces of hotels, we actually, we actually play on the spectrums and nowhere in the middle. So we okay. buy luxury, ultra high five star luxury. We just bought the Waldorf in Park City, Utah. That was our you know five star luxury hotel. And then within a couple of weeks, we closed on a residence inn in Podunk, Louisiana. Um, and so we like to play on both sides. And 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 the reason why is, you know, luxury gets these massive uh, developmental um, uh, returns for, because their cap rates are so low, right? There, there's a there's luxury in places like Hawaii or L.A. and even in Park City, they'll trade at sub four cap rates. And so you develop it or you do a rebrand or you do a reposition or something like that on the luxury side. This is where you get like these ridiculous return profiles. But on the other hand, luxury gets hit first, right, in a recession. For example, in COVID, luxury went from like 50, 60 percent occupancy down to almost zero, right? Closed down, shut down. Whereas like if you had a Fairfield in Podunk, Louisiana, Podunk, Texas, that thing went from like 75 percent occupancy to like 55 percent occupancy, like even during COVID, right? And so we have a we actually target a ratio between the two of getting all the cash flow, super steady cash flow. You're not gonna have crazy multiples, super steady cash flow on the limited service side, and then ultra luxury for the for the for the pretty big developmental uh, equity multiples. Wow. So a little a little bit of a barbell approach then. Uh, you know, going for both sides. That's that's really cool. Do you have like a target allocation percentage uh, to each of them, the high end luxury or uh, the lower end, or is it just kind of you take a deal as it comes and you know, if it's your criteria, yeah, you move forward with it. No, yeah. So we, we do have a, a ratio. We do have about a 10 to 1 ratio. So it's about 10 limited service to every one luxury. And so across okay. our you know, 200, and that ends up being close to 50-50 in terms of assets. Um, so like of our 220, now, now 30, 
of, of our asset center management and, and our actual real estate that we own about a little under half of that is in luxury. And then the other rest um, is in, is in a limited service. Oh, cool. Okay. And do you have like different investor bases that you go to for these, you know, different, you know, types of assets, or do you kind of, you know, pitch them all to your, your entire investor base? Yeah. So definitely, definitely different investor base, particularly when you syndicate on the limited service side. I mean, these are small deals. These are, you know, maybe they get into the mid teens, but these, you know, residence ins, courtyards, Fairfields, a lot of times we're buying them outside. We, we don't even like to go downtown, even on those types. We typically find a, a, a you know, a, a metropolitan area that we like and draw like a 30 minute circle around it and, and try to hit those more suburban markets. Um, and, and within that, you know, these deals are, it's called a $10 million deal. The, you know, the, the equity on that is three, maybe three and a half, four million. Um, we, you know, we can't get institutional big folks to get, you know, necessarily, maybe if we did a roll up of those, you know, right. we, we were looking yeah. at a, at a, at a, you know, $175 million portfolio of, like you know 20 of those things um that would be exciting but a lot of these one-offs a lot of times we find locals we have some other you know friends and family type of investors and then on the luxury side yeah we have you know we've worked with um huge family offices couple institutions uh and and, and their appetite you know favors obviously writing writing the the bigger checks we, we had one investor one single investor uh write a 127 million dollar check um into into a deal and that was a wow that was a that was a crazy close it sounds like you know you do you you do a uh, a lot of different things in investing. You've had a lot of different experiences. You know, in, in our ecosystem, we have a lot of just plain emerging managers, right? Emerging allocators, investors. You know, what's uh, you know from someone who's you know been able to you know take the bull by its horns and move successfully over the past year, especially with you know all macros. Like, what what advice do you have for you know people listening on this call that are you know, thinking about, you know, starting their own fund or managing their own fund. Um, yeah. What's, what's some life advice from Kaloa? Yeah. Um, so I, I actually think that, uh, and this, this, this is applicable to generally entrepreneurship, but I think it's particularly relevant in, in funds. Um, and that is, I, I see too often uh, people taking a, a problem first approach uh, when they, when they're trying to solve for what they're going to be investing in particularly in asset class. Right. So what they'll say is, um, look, you know, multifamily is, you know, cap rates starting to expand and like there's an opportunity to buy there. I'm going to go raise a multifamily, a multifamily fund or, or, you know, self-storage is, you know, underbuilt in my area. And like, I'm going to go, and that's like a problem, like identifying a problem and trying to solve the problem. And that, that works. I'm not saying it doesn't work, works for a lot of people, but particularly if you don't have like background in that area, I actually think that a tools-based approach is, is better. And that is look around and say, what are the tools that I have? Right, available to me. So, you know, do do, do I have a, a competitive advantage in anything? Do I do I work in an industry? And if I work in a manufacturing plant, right, I, and I know manufacturing plants, and I probably know thirty manufacturer plant owners and managers and and supply chain, like all throughout. So, I would look, and that's how I got into hotels. Was you know, I was I was practically raised in hotels. My my my, my dad is working hotels his entire career. Um, and so I looked around, and said, like, if I was going to have you know three steps ahead of somebody in buying an asset class what would that asset class be? And for me, it was hotels. And, and so we were able to move really, really quickly. So if, if I was someone like that, I'm looking at private equity role, but I think some guys like doing a veterinary roll up, veterinary clinics. And I think he's a vet, he's a vet, right? Which makes sense. So he goes in there and he looks, okay, what are the tools I have? Who are the people that I know? What are the things I can leverage off of? Um, start there, I think is typically a little bit better than just like, oh, you know, I think that the market is long. I'm just going to like put together a hedge fund and start shorting securities. All. Like, I don't know, it's kind of weird to, to think about it that way. No, hey, I, I honestly couldn't agree more with you. Like, you know, I've seen hundreds of hundreds of emerging managers come through our programs over the past couple of years. And it's all about, uh, you know, taking an inventory of your resources, right? Both on the capital side. So like demand for your product, you know, like do what type of relationships do you have? And then your capacity to effectively allocate there. And, you know, it goes back to your resources of what experience and legs up do you have. You know, you brought up a great point earlier about, you know, you're bringing these, you have these smaller deals that are a three to $4 million raise. And you, a lot of people don't understand that you can't take that to an institutional shop, right? Like they, they don't want to write checks for three or 4 million. They want to write checks for three or 400 million. Right. And so, you know, your, your offerings have to fit your investor demand. So I, I don't like, I, I love that comment. That's, that's great. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and one of the, you know, a, a big piece of that is, and, and it's funny, you know, coming from a, a legal background, uh, 
the, the amount of work that it takes to close a ten million dollar deal, like so, I, you know, we 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 closed the Waldorf's nine figure asset. You know, we we actually closed that uh, in two days after we signed the PSA. All cash. yeah. Wait, let me cut you off there. I don't know if any if if you guys if that name doesn't ring a bell to you guys, <laughs> I don't know if you appreciate how big of a deal that is. So I'm I'm local. I'm here in you know Salt Lake City area, and that's that's a big freaking deal. Like that's a that's a well known. Uh, you know, location. So kudos, man. Like that's, that's awesome. That, that's so, yeah. All right. Sorry to cut you off. But no, I no, no, it's good. Yeah. There's a, it's, it's, you know, it's, how big that was. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's funny. It's funny when you list out in, in one of our, in one of our slides in our pitch decks after we closed that deal is, um, you know, there's only 13 Waldorfs in the entire U S uh, and so what we have is we have one of the pitch decks that shows all the owners of the 13 Waldorfs, not a very long slide. Right. Yeah. And it shows, true. And it's like, you know, sovereign wealth fund, you know, huge multi-billion dollar private equity firm has been around for 45 years, some billionaire tech founder out of you know, SF, and then it's like Wolfram Capital, right? <laughs> so it's, like, it's a great, like, like uh, you know, associating ourselves with, with, with all those other owners. Um, but like on, on a deal like that, uh, you know, that deal was complicated and there was, um, it was a great deal for us because there was a lot of hair on it that, that had to be worked out. Um, but in reality, closing that, you know, nine figure deal was not like 10 times more work or more effort than closing that $10 million deal. So that's when you think about like in a big institutional fund, right? They're, they're trying to deploy, you know, hundreds of millions, maybe several billion into asset classes. And so they're underwriting of a $100 million deal that they can do once and spend the legal fees one time to spend into that versus underwriting 10 residence ins in, you know, middle of nowhere, you know, somewhere, even if those deals are good deals, um, it's the same amount of effort, right? And and so just yeah. the numbers are different on the contracts, and so um, that's 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 what, kind of a lot of what's undergirding that that analysis. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. You uh, you know, you started. So what is it? A year ago? Two years ago? Year, year, a year ago. And you know, you've raised millions of dollars in equity capital. Uh, you know, for these deals, I feel like that's uh, at least a mental hurdle for a lot of people. Um, you know, before they've actually gone out and. You know, tried to raise money for something. Can you walk us through your experience in 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 fundraising and and maybe some tips, tricks, or stories that you have that you could share? Sure. Um, so I, I think the first one is understanding that that what you do as an investment manager is a well loved and well and and much needed product or service for for groups, right? So th th there has to be the shift that. Um, you know, you're not a, you're not a, you know, car salesman knocking on people's doors that no one wants to hear about, like for the right people, they, they will, they, they dream about meeting you. Right? That is their full-time job is to meet people like you. Um, and so that, like, once you have that shift that look, we, we offer product or service that, um, you know, our, 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 our last portfolio of hotels, we had a 17% cash on cash return. Right. Um, even in 2021, which was like, you know, the average was well less than that across hospitality. Um, and there's a whole bunch of ways we do that. We vertically integrate. We just bought an insurance firm. We acquired a management company and merged it. And we do a whole bunch of things to, to, to try to do that. But but at its core, right, what, what fund managers need to understand is that if they're good at what they do, just like, you know, when I, when I managed a VC fund, I loved when founders wanted to pitch them because my entire thing was finding good founders. And so if I had 100 people emailing me about their startup, that was awesome. So that, that's like the first I'll call it, you know, mental shift that has to happen. Um, and then after that, it's, man, there's so, there's so much of, of, of raising capital that is um, not, not to do relationship based, but it's like skill based, right? So there's, mm -hmm. I think uh, people come to us all the time for LP checks and we've done a couple of LP stuff here and there. Um, there, I would say the biggest trick is doing some customer like discovery beforehand. So trying to understand what their goals are, what kind of investment horizons, what kind of, what kind of deals they've had in the past. Like, Skipping past all that is 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 is, is almost fatal uh, when when you start to pitch. And I love you know just uh, you know something else you said earlier. I think you know going into these things from an uh, an abundance mindset and not an not a scarcity mindset, right? Like everyone, you know what you're saying earlier. It feels like you need the investor like really bad, but in most cases they need you, right? They need good managers. They need guys like Kalo out there uh, that can do all the the, the legwork, do all the hard lifting. And uh, you know, be a good steward of, of investor capital. So, so I love that. Um, oh, why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, what the future looks like for uh, you know Wolfgram Capital? Uh, you know, what are you are you guys plan on you know doing the the same stuff, just ten times bigger, or uh, do you have new products you're bringing to market? I mean, tell me how are you, yeah. how are you about the next decade? Yeah, so it's, it's you know it's funny in that um, 
we, we grew really fast, right? So, so that, yeah. that was, and that was, and that was not, ex, that wasn't necessarily expected. We, we actually had planned on like our first year buying like one or two hotels um, and, and, you know, kind of growing from there. And, and then the deals started coming through and, and because COVID was so bad for hotels, uh, I mean, the, the deals that were coming through, not, not all in all cases, but there was, there was some distress. There were some hotels that, you know, loans were coming due, interest rates were rising, right? At the same time. And, and yeah. they, they had fully recovered from COVID, kind of this perfect storm. Um, and so we, yeah, we, we grew really fast and, and a couple of things that are happening on our firm internally. One is that, um, we doubled the size of our team because we needed to just handle, we had three of us that was running, you know, this $230 million portfolio, wow. uh, you know, several dozens over just under a dozen hotels, um, you know, hundreds of employees across the hotels. And, and we also have the management company that manages our hotels. So I was going to ask you, so do you, do you have your own management company then, or do you outsource? Yeah. No, so we so we we started our own property management company. We actually just got uh, a former regional director at Marriott Corporate to come over. We poached him to come over and lead that. Wow, hey, that's um, a win. That's great. Yeah, yeah, just a couple of weeks ago, and then we hired a CFO, former investment banker at, at, uh, at Merrill Lynch. He led you know forty billion of acquisitions. He's coming over in house CFO. We had a head of construction who's built the Ritz Carltons and JW Marriotts coming over. He had our instruction, had our construction. Um, but in terms of next, like, what what does our next year look like? Um, so there are a couple of things that, that, that happened that, that are now starting to bear fruit that we're going to kind of dig into deeper. So one was not only did we start our own management company, we then acquired another management company and merged them. So we get some licenses. So when, when you manage hotels, you know, you have a license for IHG hotels, Marriott, Hilton, and even within those brands, you have, um, you know, licenses for a Fairfield versus a, you know, full service Marriott, blah, blah, blah. And so there was some strategic acquisitions we did, merged them all together. And that is now, you know, really starting to go into its own. And, and we're trying to really spin that as like it's completely self-operating uh, company before we were doing all, wearing all hats. And now we're starting to hire some specialists, right, to get in there and, and run that. Um, the other thing we realized pretty early is that insurance is expensive and it's a yearly oh, cost. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, and so we put together a full enterprise management team. We bought an insurance firm and put together a full enterprise management team. Like we, we were shocked at what we were able to do on our hotels, even small things like you know, one of the one of the highest costs that a hotel incurs uh, when it comes to, like insurance claims um, is, is either fire, but but right below that, especially when we think about controllable costs, is water damage. So it's real common, yeah. right? Everyone's in their in their hotels; they don't turn something off, and something floods, or there's a pipe. You know, every room has bathrooms, and some have you know showers, all that kind of, or some have um, not just showers but kitchens and all that. And and so, uh, you know, small things like our insurance team was looking at, and say, look, you know, you put these little sensors in, twenty bucks a room, and like you can. Not only do you go to market and you go to the brokers and you go to the, the insurance firms and say, look, we have all this data that we can actually provide um, and, and we control the operations. And, and that, that brings out we, we dropped our premium, even which is like historically high premium year 2021 across our portfolio. We dropped it like 35 percent. And then we get to capture the premium because we own the insurance firm. So we get to capture some of that. Um, wow. And so that's starting to be kind of kind of kind of going off. Um, and then the other side is we're starting to expand different markets. So, you know, we had our markets. We like portfolios in areas because we can do cluster management with our own property management, right? Share an engineer, share a GM across a couple of properties. Um, and so now we're expanding different markets. We currently have uh, 225 million under contract. That's scheduled to close in the next two quarters. So we're going to double the size of the firm in the next six months. Um, awesome. So we're, we're, we're moving. Yeah, sounds like it. Holy cow. I mean, so every firm has, you know, different issues when they go from, you know, 1 million to 10 million, 10 to 100 million. It sounds like you guys are in that 100 million to a billion, you know, journey. Um, and, and I love the direction. I think that's great. You know, starting to take, you know, things in house, right? Setting up your own management companies, insurance companies, right? There's so many costs associated with doing deals and running funds. Like, why not do it yourself? So what I always tell everyone is if you can if you can provide a good or service at or below fair market value, um, you're doing good by your LPs, right? Because you're saving them money, um, you know, so they get a higher return. But if you can do it, you, if you can fulfill a service at or below fair market value, there's no reason you shouldn't start your own, you know, uh, company. So I think that's I think that's awesome. So kudos. Wait, it sounds like I mean, after only being open for a year, you guys are already jumping into that. That's that's really impressive. Um, and then new products. That's, that's so exciting. Um, so you, with all of this, you kind of, you know, alluded to it, you've got a lot of human capital demands, uh, you know, and, uh, either from an executive level or more analysts, lower tier, 
level, um, you know, walk me through what you look for when you're vetting partners or, you know, key level executives. Like, uh, how do you how do you choose people for your team? Because it, it is such an important part of this journey and uh, often overlooked. So, you know, share with us how you look at that. Yeah. So so obviously, um, you know, the 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 type of vetting that we do for, you know, a GM is going to be different than the, the vetting we do for a CFO and these are that, but there are definitely some broad principles that, that we look at. One yeah. is we try to be as objective as possible. And so we actually have a, um, an internal, uh, system that we, you know, we, we try to ask all the, when we're interviewing for GM, we try to ask all the GMs the same question, right? So we can really compare them against each other. When we're interviewing for, you know, finance we try to ask all the same questions. And the way that we also, we also have a, a rating system that we use is one, two, three, and four. We don't have a middle. The reason why we do that is that you have to make when you know, might go through three or four rounds of interviews and you know one is you know bottom of the market in, in a certain skill area two is below average three is above average four is you know world class level in, in a certain particular area so that might be in you know innovation that might be in strategy that might be in risk mitigation that might be in finance um mm -hmm. and and one thing i found is that you know things kind of come to the mean if unless you force it out into like that one two three four so when he, when he discusses a team like you have to say are they above average or below average right there's no there's no middle ground you can't just say average 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 and you rank them across you rank them across um skill ratings and what we look for is we look for spikiness not for necessarily even well-roundedness so we're looking for a partner right i'd rather have someone who is world class at finance and below average at you know uh speaking skills because we're not looking for him to be the, you know, the speaker or whatever. We want world class on that. I'd rather have that than a, than a bunch of threes, right? I'd rather have someone who has fours, 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 a couple twos than someone who has a, you know, some twos and a bunch of threes. Um, and then the other piece, yeah. And then and then the other piece that we look at is I think when it comes to those who make investment decisions, right? Those who are just the, the principles. Um, one of the things that that really matters is, you know, are they able to identify risk? Are they able to qualify the risk? And then are they able to mitigate risk? I think across those three things, and those in my mind, almost all of our investment decisions roll up to those three buckets, right? Are they able to identify the risk? Do they see the things that can go wrong and, and list out all of them, right? Even if it's as silly as, you know, something that almost out of our control, then can they qualify it, right? Can they can they understand which of those risks are most likely to happen, least likely to happen? And also there's some expense, you know, calculation within there. And then do they know how to mitigate that risk, right? Can they can, they, can the business plan and business strategy informed by these two things? mitigate those risks. And we, we look for the ability to do those things across their career, across asset classes, kind of as they're, if we're looking at true, a principal position. Wow. Awesome. Uh, th that's gold. I, I love it. So let me ask you this though. Do you, uh, like in terms of making those hiring, like final hiring decisions, do you have this potential hire interview with all members of your team? Is there a final decision maker? Is that you, you know, do you want to be involved in all those decision making? And obviously as your firm grows, like, cause what's your, what's your head count right now of your internal team? You said it's six. On the executive side. Yeah. There's only six of us. <laughs> okay. So, you know, obviously as that grows and you start bringing in more and more uh, money, like how do you guys think about that? Yeah. So all of the, so, the, so there's kind of a, I think I think about hiring in like in like groups, right? There's there's, there's the types of hiring that that is important, and and, and I do interview with, with every with every new hire my, myself. Um, okay. I think it's important, especially on this stage. I I don't think you can also you know if if we're Blackstone and you have you know hundred thousand employees, okay, yeah, you know you're probably not interviewing you know the analysts, but 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 I but I interview and, and talk with everyone. We run them through the the founders, three of us that are the co-founders. Um, and we, we interview all of them and we have kind of a separate things that we're looking for and then we come together and then we make a decision as a team. It's a pretty, pretty quick process. We try to make decisions using like sometimes same day, sometimes day after, um, because I think that if you know, one of the things we try to, if it's, it, the way that we look at human capital, the same way we look at our investment opportunities, we would solve for conviction, right? Where if, if, if we're looking at, at two investments equally and one invest and one investment is like, oh, we have two out of the three and it's like, yeah, it'll probably be fine. Versus one that's like all three is like, that is a home run. Like, obviously you'd want that one. And so when we get employees that are like, you know, yeah, like maybe some people have reservations. A lot of times they, they just don't make the cut, right? We, we, we want to look for, when we're talking about our internal team on the, on, the, on the capital side, we want all three super high conviction. And because we're going to work with these people and, and they're going to be, uh, you know, huge factors of our success on a small team like that. You think about one person, let's say we hire another person, seven, right? That's like what, 20% of our team? Like 20% of our firm success in this one person. Yeah. And you think about it that way. Imagine your investment. Imagine your investment. 20% of its profits is coming from one person, right? It's hugely important. Wow. That's a, that's a great way to look at it. I love it. 
Well, great. Thank you. I, we're about out of time here. We've covered a lot of topics. It's been an awesome conversation today. So, you know, if people are, excuse me, if people are interested in learning more about like Wolf Grand Capital or trying to get in touch with you, you know, where's a good place that they can go uh, to learn more about you guys? Yeah. So we have a pretty simple website, wolfgram.com, uh, W O L F G R A M M uh, dot com. My email is my first name at my last name dot com, which makes it easy. Kaloa at wolfgram.com. And then I, and I respond, I, I see all the emails, things like that. So if people want to get in touch or, or talk or, or chat through, or if they have hotels to sell, um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Well, great, man. Well, I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on today and, you know, sharing some words of wisdom and your traction. I mean, if you're, if you made it this far in the past 12 months, man, I, just think what the next 24 or 36 are going to yeah. take you. That's, that's super exciting. So uh, Chloe, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.